Welcome to Open Plaza Talks, created by the Hispanic Theological Initiative. Each episode focuses on a topic that matters to you, whether you are in the field, the academy, or the clergy. In today's conversation, Dr. Willie Jennings talks to Dr. Teresa Delgado about his new book, After Whiteness, An Education in Belonging. This episode is part of the Theological Education Between the Time series, an initiative out of HTI Member School, Emory University Chandler School of Theology. For more information about today's talk, go to htiopenplaza.org. Hello and welcome to another edition of Open Plaza. My name is Teresa Delgado. I am a professor of religious studies at Iona College in New Rochelle, New York, and the director of the Peace and Justice Studies program there. It is my absolute honor and pleasure to be um, hosting this conversation today with my dear brother, Dr. Willie James Jennings, uh, who is among many things, um, an associate professor of systematic theology and Africana studies at Yale University Divinity School. Um, we are going to be having a conversation, which I'm sure will go in lots of different directions, but we'll start with his incredible uh, book that has been, I think I, I must have read it through at least twice, maybe three times, because I just kind of pick it up. And um, as you can see from all of my little markings here, um, but this, this book as part of the Theological Education Between the Times series couldn't be more timely. And in many ways is timeless uh, because of the issues that, that he raises and the, the ways in which you've gone about um, articulating these pressing concerns within theological education and education more broadly um, are still so very much with us. So welcome, Willie. Thank you, Teresa. It is a joy to be here with you, my dearest sister. I'm so glad to be able to talk about this book and the issues that I try to address in it. I know that you've been so very involved mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. so many aspects of theological education mm -hmm. as a faculty member, as an administrator, as a consultant for institutions. Mm -hmm. um, this, in, the, in reading this book, it felt like in many ways a, a culmination of all of, that, of those journeys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. so what really prompted you to, to want to write it and then also to write it in the way that you did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, today, so I, the, the, the book, I have been wanting to write this book for a while. It's been percolating in me. And, you know, I wanted to kind of give people access to the kind of stream of consciousness that's always going through me about our, our shared world in theological and religious studies and the academy. But what, and I put on my, on my uh, list of things to do after I got done with this, the next big book I'm working on, but <clears throat> Ted Smith, who um, was uh, spearheading this Theology Between the Times book series, which was the next iteration of um, a, the Lilly funded project of looking at the status of theological education. Um, the earlier iterations of it gave us uh, the, the two magisterial books by D David T Kelsey, and then before that, the, the you know, epic book, A Theologia, um, uh, by, um, oh, his name escapes me right now, but um, it'll come to me in a minute, but uh, um, Theologia, that, that important text. So Ted Smith was um, charged with doing another one, and instead of doing one book, he wanted to bring together a group of folks to each write about um, theological education from various perspectives. It was a marvelous group of folks. And so he approached me and I said, Ted, I would love to do this, but this is not, I'm so busy. So you need to do this now. And so I, I, I took the spirit of God to be speaking through Ted at that moment. And so 
the Between the Time series really is uh, a groundbreaking series where you have, um, there's uh, 12 of us or 13 of us each writing a book from, from a perspective. And so far, my book has come out, uh, Mark Jordan, Carrie Day's book just came out, um, uh, uh, Chloe's son, uh, Amos Young, um, our dear sister, um, um, mm, name just ran out of my head. I see her, Elizabeth Clondy Frazier, mm -hmm. her wonderful book, and Dan Aylshire's book. Um, and, there's a, and there's a few more folks who have texts coming out. So each of us is writing a small book. But what I needed to do in this book was to try to bring people into the, the inner sanctum, into the, mm. into the back room, into mm -hmm. the kitchen, into the, down into the bowels of the whole educational endeavor, not only of theological education, but of Western education. And so I knew, as you know, my dear sister, I knew that if I tried to approach what I wanted to talk about with, mm -hmm. just, with just standard um, intellectual presentation that we find in any the, in any academic book, it would be resisted because people yeah. people would mount arguments for it before I even got to the door. Mm -hmm. So let me not just try to um, write a standard academic text about theological education about Western education. Mm -hmm. Let me let me come into the back door and start to tell the truth from mm -hmm. deep down inside of it. Mm -hmm. And um, and the fact is is that the the matters that I want to talk about, I couldn't get to it just by standard academic writing. Yeah. I can only get to, get to it by drawing on, on all the sides of what it means to talk and write about life, but also all the sides of me. So, you know, I, I, I have my poetry, I have um, vignette, I have um, short story, and then I have some analysis. And in that way, what I try to do is to bring people into the back door. As I say in the opening line of the book, I was an academic dean Mm -hmm. I learned all the secrets. Yes. I cannot tell you the secrets, mm -hmm. but I can tell you what they mean. Yeah. And so what I was trying to do is to bring people into the meaning of the secrets that we all mm -hmm. know so well. And part of it, the, what also drives this book, as you mentioned in your opening comments, what also drives this book is the recognition of um, many years of sitting with people as they struggle inside the academy. And the, the sides that the students don't see, the sides in many ways that colleagues don't see amongst each other, the mm -hmm. side that administrators don't show to faculty, um, the side that staff doesn't show to anybody else. And so to be deep inside that world, it was time for, for people to see it and understand its significance for our shared work together. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for the gift of it. Uh, it's very powerful. There is probably going, to, I'm probably going to shed a tear more than once throughout this conversation <laughs> because I did, as I was reading it, the tears of recognition, really, right? Mm -hmm. the, the sense that, that there's a deep, intimate knowing mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you are lifting up and, and, you are making yourself vulnerable and inviting the reader to do the same for yeah. the sake of our shared vocation yeah. of, of teaching, of learning, of yeah. theological education, of education more, more broadly. One of the things that, that really struck me as I was reading it was in many ways, as you were going after and, and making explicit the, the connective tissue mm -hmm. within higher education. And one of those the fibers of connective tissue is that of coloniality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how coloniality and white supremacy are serving each other and acting as this connective tissue within our Western education, the way that you went about this, the telling of that story, not, not just using academic language, mm -hmm. but using poetry, using the vignettes, um, was in a way, a, your, your method 
was consistent with the content itself. It felt to me. Yeah. That is, here you were going about critiquing the ways that we've done education, the, you know, the, the high level of the, the, the transcendence mm -hmm. of education, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the ways in which we, we go for the jugular, mm -hmm. um, the no holds barred that you talked about in one of your vignettes, mm -hmm. that way of doing doctoral studies, of putting th people through the ringer. Yeah. Your method was showing a different way. Yeah, yeah. That it's not just, it, it's about the aesthetics of our lives. Yeah. The absolutely. poetry that we're trying to, to maintain and, and, and preserve mm -hmm. in order for us to thrive. And that is the sickness that our education system has been infected with our inability to do that, a refusal to do that. So I, it was so, it was beyond just refresh. It was just such a, like I said, a gift to read that way. And it reminded me of, of uh, Raul Peck's methodology hmm. in his documentary, Exterminate All the Brutes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which in which he weaves his own personal story and and other ways of knowing yeah yeah into this larger because you can't tell the story of white right. supremacy and colonialism and its impact on institutions with without sharing it in that way no i think um, that's exactly right i think that's exactly right the um and it, I, i'm I'm thankful for that um, comparison to that fabulous documentary. You, you, you know, my dear sister, here's the thing that I think is so important for us to keep in mind that, um, you know, these big ideas like coloniality, even like white supremacy, they work themselves down into our bones. Yes, they do. They work, they work themselves down into the everyday. Mm -hmm. And in the book, what I was trying to draw people to, all of us who are involved in this whole thing called education, that we, we are all very early confronted with that man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that when, you know, our love for learning, our love for um, knowledge, our curiosity mm -hmm. brings us into the academy. And at some point in time, very early, very early, that man approaches each of us and says, okay, you wanna be here? Then you have to put your dream down and pick up my dream. Mm -hmm. You have to put down what you want to become and you have to pick up what I want you to become. Mm -hmm. And for so many of us, we, we learn to forget that moment when we actually took his dream into ourselves mm -hmm. and said that, okay, in order for me to be here, I've got to be like him. Mm -hmm. And this is what he, this is the price of the ticket to mm -hmm. quote Baldwin, this is the mm -hmm. price of the ticket. And so the challenge is to help people see that that, that is the beginning of mourning. That is the mm -hmm. beginning of pain. That is the beginning of grief because at that moment to inhabit this place, you agree to let this man inhabit you mm -hmm. and move your life toward a becoming tied to him. And the re tragedy of it is, is that th there is no way to become him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, one can try to become him, mm -hmm. but, it's a, but it's a mimicry that is tied to sorrow. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is to say, okay, but there's an alternative to that. There's an alternative to that image of the educated state, the educated man, that the alternative to the white self-sufficient man that I talk mm -hmm. about in this book, who exhibits the dismal virtues, demonically derived virtues of possession, mastery of control, mm -hmm. there's an alternative to him. And that brings us to Jesus in the crowd. It brings us to a re, a, the cultivation of a reality of gathering mm -hmm. that, that that should recenter, that should center our intellectual life, and aim us toward the goal in our work and through our work, creating belonging. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to try to do that um, requires, as you as you've been pointing out, it requires. Uh, I, I had to bring people back to the stories that they've hid away, right? Yes. It's, the stories of, you know, the first time you went back to your room, your dorm room or whatever room, mm -hmm. and you sat there in tears because, you know, you know somebody had just 
called you everything in, uh, uh, but but a child of God mm-hmm. <laughs> in, mm-hmm. in the way they in the, in the way they treated you. Yes, it's and so true. Is- I mean, yes, and 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 I think part of my, you know, as I said before, the the reason that my my tears are flowing because there was so much recognition about that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, you don't, uh, and and you know my story, right, Willie. Right, I mean, right, you right. you know the, how long it took me to finish my 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 doctorate, right. and I, I think I I know that I've shared that with you. And mm-hmm. within those twelve years, I, I know there were multiple multiple times where mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. thinks, "Am I am I actually did I make the right choice? Right. I am so not fit for this." If I'm using the judgment of others right. and the per- even right. just the perceived judgment of others as the the litmus test for right. my fitness for um for this work so one of the things that really struck me and and I'm so grateful that you included that powerful uh picture mm-hmm. of the racial paterfamilia yeah yeah. yeah. Um, because in that, I mean, it was in such a striking way, this microcosm yes. of everything. Right. <laughs> not right. just to educate, but of everything. Right. right. And and as I sat and, and, and looked at that over and over, I guess my my because you it's a hopeful you end on a very hopeful note. I mean, mm-hmm. there is, there's mm-hmm. tremendous hope here. There's a sense you wouldn't have written this if right. there wasn't that I sense of belief mm-hmm. that we can do differently. Right, right. We yeah. can make a decision to do differently. Mm-hmm. So there's one thing to, there's one thing, on, on the one hand, one can do differently as individuals yes. within yes. these institutions. Right. And it's quite another for institutions right to make a decision to do differently how what's your sense of hopefulness about the latter that is given the state of theological education and so much doom and gloom language Mm -hmm. that has been Mm -hmm. you know percolating for a number of years now Yeah, yeah um what's your sense of institutions' ability, willingness, capacity mm-hmm. to do differently. Yeah, I do think, I think we're in a moment when, when many institutions are realizing they have to do differently. And um, on the one hand, many of them are realizing they have to do, do differently because just the entire financial modeling that they have existed inside of no longer works. And so they, so at one level, they got to do differently because they want to survive. At another level, they want to do differently because they realize the demographic shifts that are happening so profoundly mm-hmm. in, especially theological education, because increasingly the number of people who still want to come and engage in theological education at any level are people of color. Mm-hmm. And increasingly schools are realizing this, this, is, a, this is our student present and this is our student future. And um, we, have to, we have to become the kind of school that reflects our student present and our student future. But then there's a third level, I think, that um, is driving it. And this, for me, this is the, in some ways, this is the most important. People are, some people are starting to realize that um, uh, institution and institutional practice, as it has been, has been profoundly harmful, both collectively and individually. And so um, to have an institution that does not do harm to those who inhabit yeah. it and who practice its institution life, who carry forward its institutional life requires that we have to rethink it. And so I think that there are a number of people who are realizing, as I say in that chapter, that an institution is not just about the way it thinks, but also the way it feels. Mm -hmm. And institution feeling now is coming to the surface as much as institutional thinking. But it will require folks who decide that I don't want to be 
like those who went before me. I don't want to be like that man who ran this institution before we got here. And I, I don't want the institution to look like those gentlemen who ran it before we got here. Now, nothing, you know, no, no, no need to, you know, curse the past, but what we must do is recognize that we cannot continue to inhabit a certain kind of institutional persona that we think is necessary for it, for the efficient, uh, excellent movement of the institution that harkens back to the brutality of the past or the insensitivity of the past or the, um, the, the ways people were exploited in the past. Right. So I do think that can happen, but the problem for us is that there's still very little training whether one wants to be a faculty person, whether one wants to be an administrator, whether one wants to be in charge of an institution, there's still very little training that draws people into a new possibility. Mm -hmm. That is, draws people into a vision of their leadership, the vision of their administration, vision of their teaching that builds belonging. Yeah. And that simply, you know, seeks to show, to show that they are that self-sufficient man. Mm -hmm. who can who can operate in possession control and mastery yeah. and so it, it, when we decide that um being healthy hmm. <laughs> is as important as being effective <laughs> then i think we'll, we'll be on yes. the verge we'll be on the verge of a different way of doing things but and i do think there are enough people especially in 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 this covid moment and this blm moment and this one where people are there's a, a number of levels of reckoning among us. I think there are enough people realizing, okay, I can't, I can't go back and be that because there's really no, there's no place for that here. Mm -hmm. There's no need for that here. Nobody wants to hear that. Yeah. But what people do want to hear, what people do want to see is somebody who knows how to gather people together to listen and to draw people into a shared project of learning, mm -hmm. a shared project of education. Not just you can carry out what I think has to be carried out, but this is a shared project. Now, I appreciate that because that's that's definitely a word that that I need to hear. You know how how to be um, in that in that world, but not of that world. Yeah. Right. Not not to um, not to buy into that. And I think that that's so very hard. I, uh, you know, I see that that image of that of the preacher. Yeah. You know, in yeah. that yeah. in that yeah. depiction, um, and it's it's our kinfolk. Right. I yes, mean, yes, yes, yes. So you know, as you were talking about the demographic changes within higher education and within theological education mm -hmm. um, and this sense of reckoning, you know, within our society about how we can do better and must do better. Yeah. Um, particularly around anti-racism one of the things that we're seeing now is is a more latinx more african american more asian um folks are being called on to mm -hmm. take those roles of leadership absolutely within these institutions mm -hmm. and on the one hand i'm i'm thinking okay maybe this is a moment and then as i was reading your book i'm thinking like wait a minute like there's a there's a hesitation on my part mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because i wonder is, does the institution because it has such a life of its own right um does it suck one in oh yeah in Absolutely. ways that can, that it's it, it's hard to then decouple from even with the best of intentions. Right, right, right. No, you, you put your finger right on some, the, one of the classic difficulties. I mean, uh, historically, we are inside, we are inside someone else's dreaming. Mm -hmm. today. We're inside someone else's planning, someone else's design, as I say in the book. And the challenge is, is what, while we might be in somebody else's dreaming, planning and designing, we can design inside of that design. We can mm -hmm. plan inside that planning. We can do something different inside of it. But we, but what we have to decide when, when we are in leadership of anything, when we step inside anything, what we have to decide is whether we will imitate the bully that went 
ahead of us. Mm -hmm. As I say in the book, you know, bullies, not, not, not bu bullies may be hated, but some bullies are imitated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and some bullies you know, are imitated, especially when we imagine what's necessary to be efficient and effective in leadership and running institutions. And I think for so many, so many people of color, when we wind up in positions of leadership, you know, we, we are often in those positions when the institution is in trouble and in need of, you know, really emergency administrative work. And um, emergency administrative work oftentimes, you know, by analogy, looks like, um, it looks like, you know, uh, a government that has to suspend all democratic processes in order to get things done. <laughs> and what mm -hmm. we have to be careful of is that we don't fall into the trap that um, in order to prove that we are worthy to lead, we decide that we have to lead like the ones who went before us. Right. Now, of course, <clears throat> the difficulty is that sometimes we have to ask ourselves the, the most crucial question that we often fail to ask ourselves is that um, some institutions and the way they have been structured and the way they have been planned and the way they have been designed have to die. Mm -hmm. And that <clears throat> sometimes what, one of the most important things to do when one is steps into an institution to lead is to let it die in the way that it has existed and say, I'm, if I'm going to be here, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to drive this car. We're going to take this car apart. Let we go. First of all, we're going to shut it down. <laughs> And we're going to take out the engine, take out the pieces we can use, but we're going to, we're going to build something else because <clears throat> this thing is dead. Mm -hmm. This way of being in the world, that's mm -hmm. what I mean by it. this way of imagining ourselves, this way of addressing our students, this way of treating each other in terms of administrative staff, this way of, of speaking to constituencies and building boards, this way of doing things is dead mm -hmm. because all it will do is recreate, recapitulate the very colonial logics that we don't want to operate in. And mm -hmm. so what I have to do as a leader or what I have to do as an administrator is not simply follow what went before me. I mm -hmm. have to say, okay, we're going to move forward, but we're not following that track. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is that for so many people, whether we're talking about a church or an organization or an institution, an academic institution, so many people are called into it mm -hmm precisely at the moment where the options are very limited. Yeah. And so even with limited options, they still have to make that crucial courageous step to say, even with these limited options, I'm not going to take option A. Mm. There may there only may be a half of option B, but I'm just going to take that half. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because option A is not, option A is going to t send me down five or 10 years of pain. Right. Well, th thank you for for you know lifting up that that distinction. You know, it's I guess as I'm, I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about the importance of the imagination. Yes. And and how how challenging it is to employ the imagination and employ that creativity when because that 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 speaks to the possibilities for the future that speaks to thriving mm -hmm. and that's hard to do when you're simply in survival mode right you know right. when you're simply just trying to um you know stop the hemorrhaging you can't right. think about um you know how you're going to plan your you know your your nutrition for the next week because um you know in order to think preventively if right. you're just trying to, to to stop the bleeding, I, I guess you know one one of the things that I've also was um, thought a lot about as I was reading your book was you know the ways in which um, particularly people of color are are and, and underrepresented folks folks who have been marginalized. Mm -hmm. within these structures, how we are pit against each other oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. in so many ways. And, and that in some ways that we've internalized it so well mm -hmm. that we don't need any prompting, that it just kind of kicks in. Yeah. So yeah. 
and and here you know i say that as one who has aspirations for mm -hmm. being in as you you know in mm -hmm. in academic leadership mm -hmm. um so i so my question to you lily is both from your experience and then just how you're imagining it, what what are the ways that that we can particularly as 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 Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, not just resist yes. the impulses to do what the past has done, what that, what right, that right, man right, has right, done, right, 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 but to actively pursue other ways, particularly yeah, is, with each yeah. other. This is key. This is so important. I'm so glad you're raising it. I was just saying this to another group of folks just re recently. What we all have to remember, and I, and I note this in the book, we are all caught between the dreams of the colonial masters and mm -hmm. the aspirations of his sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. His dream, looking at them was, who must, and he, he put it in, 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 in the crucial question that launched Western education in colonialism. And what's mm -hmm. that crucial question? Who must my sons and daughters become? Mm -hmm. in order to take hold of my colonial holdings and build them bigger, build them better. Who must they become to take hold of all my possessions and continue to build my legacy? And all of us in, in, in Western education are caught between those two energies, that master's dreaming and the aspirations of his sons and daughters to be what the colonial master, their dad, their granddad, their great granddad was, and to build it better. And so what does that mean? It means that for so many of us, we've not yet, let's use biblical and theological language, we've not yet, we've not yet baptized our aspirations. Mm -hmm. We've not yet allowed our, our aspirations to be crucified and then resurrected in the right way. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the crucial matter. What, what drives a wedge between so many peoples of color and so many groups is that we have these unbaptized aspirations that are driving us, our vision of success, our vision of legacy building, our, our vision of what it means to take hold of possession, our, our vision of what it means to have voice, our vision of what it means to look finished, our, our vision of what it means to be acceptable to the legacy Mm -hmm. that we have not yet thought through carefully. And so the, the, the crucial work of building together has been set aside in order to pursue the idea of building better. Better, yeah. <laughs> building to, so that I carry mm -hmm. for the legacy. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, that means that I, that I have to operate in the same racial politics that has been a part of white masculine hegemony, I'm gonna do it. If it means that I have to separate myself by constantly casting shade on peoples that don't act like me or show, show the kind of um, perfected finish that I think I have, then I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's the tragedy for us. And those of us in education, what we have to figure out is how do we rethink the aspiration that drives all of this? Mm -hmm. And for so many people, this is this is not even on on the table, right? The, the, whether we're talking about undergraduate education or graduate education, those aspirations are driven by that that horrible colonial legacy, and we need to rethink. Now, what happens when we rethink that? It means that we will start to rethink the entire evaluative ecology mm -hmm. that surrounds us in terms of how we evaluate excellence, but also that we internalize. And, and how we understand what excellence is. You know, so what, what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that we start, we stop, stop treating people um, as though they are lesser because their English doesn't sound right. Yeah. Or their writing skills are not up to snuff. Mm -hmm. As though that that is an indication indicator of their actual quote unquote intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and the, the but the problem is, is that we have not even begun to do the serious, and, and, and speaking as a Christian, the, the serious work of discipleship, of crucifying mm -hmm. colonial aspiration. Mm 
Mm -hmm. and then seeking the spirit to help us resurrect a different reality of, of, of aspiration that draws us together. We aspire not to show that we have possession, control, and mastery. We aspire to show that we know how to build belonging, mm -hmm. build connection, build life together with people who would not want to be together. Right. But this is what we do. This is the sign of our intellectual excellence. Mm -hmm. Now, what I just said is absolutely foreign, my dear sister, absolutely mm -hmm. foreign mm -hmm. to the academic exercise as it now exists. Oh, absolutely. And until we, we make what has been banished from that exercise central to it, mm -hmm. you know, as I was saying to somebody just recently, I don't care what kind of emancipatory or abolitionist thinking or mm -hmm. methodologies or practices we think that we are actualizing the academy. If we have not challenged these realities of aspiration, we, we're lying to ourselves mm -hmm. because we, we are still producing still recreating yes. the very structures and hierarchies that teach peoples to look down on other people mm -hmm. and more important, teach people how not even connect with other people. Right, right. It's a shame to have someone who is highly educated that doesn't know how to build community. Mm -hmm. that, that should be a sign, not of success, but of utter failure. Right. And to think, that this is that building of community is the is is so much a part is this, is the central message of the gospel right for a theological education to not be centered on that is a farce and how do you expose it as as the as a farce well, it shows that it shows it shows that we have uh, we have work to do in uh, pulling from ourselves the the deep colonial legacy that's embedded in what we do. And my deepest hope, as we move into the future, is that that we've reached a moment now where enough people can say to themselves. Uh, I don't want to be that. I want to be something different. You know, mm -hmm. today, so one of the best moments that happened to me in um, the, the, these last 15 years of my teaching career, and, you know, um, student, students start to come to me, white male students start to come to me, and they start to say this to me consistently. They, they would say, Dr. Jennings, you know, I love my dad. I love my uncles. I love my, my um, you know, all the men in my life. They've all been great men, but then they would look me in the face and they would say, but I don't want to be them. Mm -hmm. Help me not be them. Mm -hmm. And when that started to happen, I knew that we had reached a crucial moment. Yes. A crucial moment when they realized that they didn't want to inhabit the same kind of white male persona mm -hmm. of those that were before them. Yeah. And then they asked a the crucial question, how can I not be that? Mm -hmm. And so my hope is that we will have more folk, <laughs> not, just, mm -hmm. not just white men, but more folk who will say mm -hmm. as a fundamental education, how can we not create that? Yes. <laughs> how yes. can we create something else? Because mm -hmm. we don't want to create that. We don't want to create that in the bodies of women. We don't want to create that in the bodies of LGBTQ students. Mm -hmm. We don't want to create that in non-binary students. We don't want to create that in anybody. We don't mm -hmm. want to create that, that person, that reality. Yeah. And we can do that if we decide together that we need a different vision of education. And, and to your point, then we must come to revolution. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That, that's it. We must, we must come to, to revolution. And, uh, you know, that's what, what one of the things that I, I noted um, as I read that, I said, what does it mean for us and for the world? to desire the company of others such that we don't want to leave. Yes, yes, yes. You know, that, um, that yeah. image of yeah. your yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. being with, with this group and, and, you know, in, in, you know, among Puerto Ricanos, we always, you know, we <laughs> laugh at each other to say that, you know, it takes us about at least 30 minutes to say goodbye. Right, right. You know, right. because we know that in our own company, that we 
the sense of of community and belonging, uh, particularly as colonial subjects yes. out in the world that sees us only as that, um, to be among ourselves, and we just don't want to leave. But it's that sense of communion that we're seeking within right. education, right. and that is and that to which God calls us. Right, right. See, I think that's the key. I, I think if we can touch again the the deep desire mm -hmm. uh, for one another that that you know we often see at the exact moments when we have to say goodbye, yeah. then we, we can get a glimpse, just a just a glimpse of the desire God has for us. Mm -hmm. Right. And um what, what what we have to do is we have to we have to translate that, or should I say, we should press that deeply into intellectual formation, my sister. Mm -hmm, That's the key. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the thing is, that desire is supposed to be at the heart of intellectual formation, yes. as opposed to as opposed to this kind of morbid introspection, this deep individualism that drives so much of the very ethos, the very character of intellectual formation. But what should be there. Is precisely what you just stated. You know, mm -hmm. we I want to be together because we're doing such good stuff together. I yes. hate for I hate that this is coming to an end. I hate that right. it's coming to an end. And that reality should become a hallmark mm. of our work. So that when when people experience us and whatever we do, as those who have been educated, gone, gone through, you know, th this training, gone through theological education that what they should experience from us is not just somebody, oh, he, listen to the way she, she, you know, she interpreted that text. Wasn't that brilliant? Look, listen, look at the way she, you know, more than that, the way people are together mm -hmm. because of her is what marks intellectual excellence. Yeah. No, I, 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 I hear you and, um, you know, isn't it, isn't it something when, like, we know when that has happened, right? We, right. we, we know the moments right. when that has happened in a, in the classroom, right? You know, I just recently had that experience through teaching in the Hispanic summer program. And it was, mm. it was, it was remarkable in that sense that mm -hmm. yet here we are. Um, and we've, and folks just, didn't want to leave, even within this that that Zoom setting. So as we're 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 getting to the end of our hour, um, and we're right up against the beginning of a new semester. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so my question to you, Willie, is, and this is really it's a selfish question because I <laughs> I want I want your your wisdom and your insight on this. You know what is the the next, you know, to, to, to uh, paraphrase our friend, uh, Matthew Williams, you know, what's the next, the faithful next step <laughs> that one, that we can take going into the classroom yeah. uh, to make that space a revolutionary space, a, a space that does not prescribe to that racial patrifamilia. Yeah, yeah. We, we, have, we have to invite students and invite the whole community to speak out loud. What, what, what's our dream together now? You know, um, we, are, we are yet in the midst of this pandemic. We're yet in the midst of, you know, the ugly, the ugly reflexes of white supremacy's ever-present reality in the Western world. And we, we have to speak out loud together. What are we dreaming together now, friends? Mm. And what can we do in this class? What can we do in this um, curriculum? What can we do in um, what we're trying to do in the school? What can we do together to realize those dreams? And um, start to make some real changes in how we're gonna execute this semester, how we're gonna execute this year taking stock of what, what the dream is now. And, the, and I think for a lot of people, the dream has changed. And for some people, the dream has disappeared. They're just, you know, people are, so many people are just in survival mode. Yes. And so I think for a lot of folks, we have to say, okay, I know you might be in survival mode, but I need you to dream. I need you to dream. Mm. 
mm-hmm. because because there 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 is joy and energy and dignity in the dreaming, mm-hmm. and I got to have you take hold of that again. Okay, take hold of the dreaming. I know there's a lot of stuff that's horribly painful, but you got to dream right now. Mm-hmm. So tell me a dream, and then we, we're going to live inside the energy of that dream as we try to piece together. You know, this year, as I've been telling a lot of folk, you know, mm-hmm. um, don't expect don't expect people are going to hit the ground running this mm-hmm. fall semester, whether we're talking about undergraduate or graduate or doctoral level, folk are, folk are still feeling their way. Yeah. And so what we have to do is we have to recognize that um, we are, we are more inside our dreaming than our acting at this point. And so we're going to slowly try to step forward inside them dreams of what we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And in that regard, my hope is that if we can dream out loud together, we can start to push to the to the very edges of our consciousness, mm-hmm. that man's dream. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because that man's dream is what's, you know, is what has created this mess for us in the first place. Mm-hmm. So we're going to push to the very edge of our consciousness, this idea that I'm going to, I want to be strong, self-sufficient. I want to have mastery over this, possession of that, control. We're going to let all that go. Mm-hmm. Because that, that has never been real. And now that we know that that's so damaging. Mm-hmm. So my hope is that if we can, if we can take that first step, especially coming into this year, that by the time we finish this academic year, we're in, we'll be in a better place to move forward. Mm-hmm. I lo- that's so, just live inside the energy of our, our collective dreaming mm-hmm. is, um, is a is a powerful uh, message for me personally, yeah. and I hope for um, I'm sure for those who are listening. So thank you so much, again, my brother. Thank this you. was just I think you know this is a moment where I don't want to leave, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I always, <laughs> but I think we have to. to. You, my dear sister, always a joy to be with you. <laughs> It is a, it's a, it's a pleasure. So I guess we just have to press the pause button for now to, to be, to be continued. <laughs> to be so continued. to thank you again. You're more than welcome. You're more than welcome. My dear sister.